we advance once more, looking at chapter 17 of the gospel according to St. John. The last time we gathered here, we considered the first five verses. Now, I want us to delve today uh, into that prayer proper as Christ now prays for the disciples and we will appreciate in this context that what Christ is doing is a manifestation of his love for his disciples. He's showing of something of his love, which love he began by mentioning and he has continued to demonstrate. Look with me, for example, in chapter 13, where it all begins. This is usually called the upper room discourse, the last moments of Christ's ministry on earth. The Lord, in a short while, will be hanging on the cross of Calvary to accomplish the work of redemption, which redemption was authored by the Father and which redemption will be applied by the Spirit of God. In chapter 13 of the Gospel of St. John, in verse number 1, we read, Now, before the feast of the Passover, this is the time Christ is going to be offered. Now, just before that feast, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to, to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Christ loves those who are his own. They are in the world. He continues to demonstrate his love for them. Now, it's amazing if you move to verse number 18. Now, look at what he says in verse 18. Now, remember that in verse number 9 and 10 we saw, Judas is not part of this particular group of people that later on Christ will pray for. In verse number 9 and verse number 10, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet, but also my hands and my head. So he's washing them. And the apostle uh, Peter says, not my feet only, uh, also my hands and my feet. Jesus says to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. Verse 11, for he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of, you are, all of you are clean. Now, verse number 18. I am not speaking of all of you. You see that point? I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. He is not praying for, he's not going to talk about henceforth the 12. He's going to talk about and talk to the 11. Judas excluded. There's a context. So he says, I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But why was Judas appointed to be part of the apostleship? The Bible says, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread and lifted his ill against me. Judas is the person. So Judas is part of the apostleship, not because he has been chosen, verse number 18, but to fulfill scriptures that the one who would betray Christ and ultimately lead to his death would be one who ate his bread and lifted his ill against him. Someone who initially and ultimately would be, as it were, at the bosom of Christ. Someone close. That's the purpose for which Judas is there. So he is not part of this. Christ says, I know whom I've chosen. Judas is not part of the, the people I've chosen. And now with that context, we're in chapter 17. So he, be he begins to demonstrate his love. In 15, 16, he promises them of the coming of the Holy Spirit and he comforts them. Although they're going to face different trials and temptations in this world, he comforts them. He tells them that I have, I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm leaving you the Spirit. Remember, Judas Iscariot is not part of the people to whom the Spirit of God is promised. He's already departed. 
In verse 17, Judas is not part of this prayer. And so you begin to see that Judas later on hangs himself, we did say, and he dies, and he does not benefit from the priestly work of Christ and ultimately his death on the cross of Calvary. Now in chapter 17, look at what Christ says in verse number 9. Just to augment what we have seen, that he knows all those he has chosen. And now in 17, he prays for them. He is the high priest now. Verse number 9 in chapter 17, where we are now. The Lord says, I am praying for them. We are going to look at them, those people. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world. In verse number 9. But for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. This is a specific prayer to a specific group of people that these particular people in verse number 2 and 3 may have eternal life. So look at verse number 2 and 3. Christ prays. Let's begin from verse number 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. In, verse, in chapter 13, the hour has come, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, watch what follows, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. That's the context. There is a specific group of people that the son must give eternal life, and it is for the same group of people in 17 that Christ prays in verse number 9. And he says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Now, in this context, that group of people is the 11. Judas, we have seen, having been excluded from this group. Now, what about you and me who then would later on believe the gospel and be saved? Verse 20. Look at verse 20. I do not ask for this only, that's the 11, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. You see that? So he prays, first of all, for the immediate disciples who would later on become the apostles. But he also prays also for them that would believe the apostolic gospel, the apostolic message, in which case the believers of all time. Now Christ prays for those categories of people, the immediate disciples and the later disciples, as included. Now, this is the picture, very quickly. You have gone for an interview, a job interview, and then uh, uh, a number of you have gone into the boardroom where the interview is you know, ongoing, and one after another, you are being called to the boardroom to present you know, your CV, your resume, and as you do so, questions are asked, and then you answer them, and then a team, having undergone the interview, you are sitting at the bench outside the you know, boardroom. And then as you, as you tiptoe, you drop a conversation within the boardroom, saying, let's employ mercy. You're just passing by, and then you hear that conversation, let's employ mercy. Of all the interviewees, let's absorb mercy. How would you feel? It has not been announced. But you have heard in the board meeting, as they talk, having been dismissed from the meeting, let's absorb mercy. How do you feel? Is it something that brings joy, some comfort? This is the intention of the prayer. Because the disciples of Christ Jesus are eavesdropping a conversation between God the Son and God the Father. And they are hearing, as it were, their destinies sealed. And they are hearing that Christ is praying for them, that the Father, among many other things, would preserve them, sanctify them. I mean, those words are salvific, those are redemption words. 
In other words, he hears. They, they hear the son praying for the salvation and security. What does that mean to your soul? Is that not a show of love? <laughs> Someone prays for you that you are saved eternally. You are not lost. Is the context of 17. This is meant to encourage believers that Christ actually loves us and he shows it. Even before he dies for us, he prays for us. You have heard in the, in the Reformed tradition that we believe in the eternal security of saints. On what basis, on what ground do we believe such a lofty doctrine? It is because it is biblical is the point. That even the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, prays for the elect. A specific group of people that he prays for. Now let's get down to business and see. We are calling them the elect, therefore. Let's see who these people are. Today someone will encompass who they are. And so the subject for consideration today is this. That Christ prays specifically for the elect. You have seen that. Christ prays specifically for the elect. John 17 and verses 6 to 10. You could be wondering, how can I know, therefore, as one who is hearing the gospel today here in this hall, how can I know that I am the elect that Christ prayed for in this context? We are going to see their identity. He's going to give us the anatomy, as it were, of these people for whom he prays. And having looked at them, we can then come out of this meeting and say, surely it is I that Christ prayed for, with confidence. Let's see the anatomy. In the first place then, we are going to observe their relationship to God. The first point will be their relationship to God. Secondly, we'll observe their revelation of God. And thirdly, we'll observe their response to God. And we'll see if you qualify to be an elect, Christ prayed for you. That gives you joy. In the first place then, observe with me their relationship to God in verse number six and verse number nine. Christ says, verse six, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. There is a specific people and Christ has manifested God's name, the Father's name, to the people whom the Father gave him out of the world. There they are. How are these people related to God? First of all, let's proceed. The sentence continues, yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. You as they were. To whom do they belong? To the Father. You as they were. This is a group of people that belong to the Father. They are the Father's possession. These are people for God's own pressure, possession. They are God's precious possession. They are treasured by God just like the Israelites. And you have seen that concept even this morning as we've been looking at the covenant. That even so, the people of Israel were God's chosen nation. This concept of God electing a people that these people may be his treasured possession is not alien. It's not new to the New Testament. It is something that we begin to see unfolding in the old covenant. Now, these are the people for whom the Lord prays. They belong to the Father. It means these are people, for example, we see in Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse number 4, that the Father chose them before the foundation of the world in Christ. Before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4. That these people may belong to him. Even before they are created, the Father has chosen them that these people may belong to him as his treasured possession. They belong to the Father. Now, 
The verse continues to say, verse number six, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me. Now, first of all, they belong to the Father, but then the Father gives them to the Son. You see the point? The people whom you gave me out of the world. You as they were, and you gave them to me. He repeats the same thing, and they have kept your word. First of all, they belong to the Father. Secondly, the Father has given them to the Son out of the world. Now, this is tremendous, brothers and sisters. Again, he says, the Father has given these people to him out of the world. It means initially, these are people who belong to the world. Before they belonged to the Son, they were in the world and that they were of the world. These are people who the Father is saying is separating or setting apart from the world, out of the world. They are being drawn out of the world. They are being harvested out of the world as it were, that they may belong to the Son. It means this particular group of people, before they were drawn out of the world, given to Christ out of the world, they were worldly. They were ungodly people, unrighteous people, their worldview would be that of the world, that of the culture, their beliefs, their inclinations, and their understanding of morality. These are people who initially, as Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 3 says, were by nature children of wrath. It is not that they were special, is the point I'm making. Nothing made them special. They were just like the rest of humanity. They were in the world and of the world. And so the father draws them out of the world and gives them to the son as a gift, a love gift. Friends, you begin to see that the elect of God are not different from humanity. They're just like the rest of them. Wretched and wicked, sinful in all manner of descriptions. Now, if you, have, if, if you believe the gospel here, you are the elect of God. Now, consider your own context before you're saved. What kind of life are you living? <laughs> Were you an angel? <laughs> Do you remember how you are saved? Was it a sinful life or a holy life? You, are, it, you don't want to think about it, isn't it? So wretched. That is exactly what the Bible is saying. They were out of the world. Now Christ says in the context, now they no longer belong to the world because they have been extracted, separated, called out of the world. That's why a church is an assembly of those who have been called out of the world, removed from the world, so that their worldview changes, their belief system changes, their inclination changes, their understanding of morality and spirituality now changes. They are reconfigured, recalibrated in terms of their minds and their hearts. When they come to the kingdom of God, what happens? The same, same book, in chapter 3, Christ talking to Nicodemus. What must happen for them to belong to now a new kingdom? They must be born again from above by the Spirit. They have to change. A change occurs in and through them. And this is what Christ is helping us to appreciate as he prays for them. These are not people who are intrinsically or inherently holy or good. Because the Bible says there's no one who is righteous, not even one. No one does good, even the elect. So the elect are being humbled here, isn't it? <laughs> They're not special. It is the grace of God that makes them special. It is that blessed grace of God that finds them in their sinful context. Think of Zacchaeus. Who was Zacchaeus before Christ saved him? Task collector? A robber? He would take more than necessary, isn't it? And then he says... Now, if I've robbed someone, if I've taken more than I should, I'm going to give it four times, fourfold, because now he's repentant. This is the kind of people I talk about. Look at Peter, for example. Peter, when, when the Lord draws to him at the beaches of, of Galilee, you know, and, and the Lord helps him to have a catch when he draws his, his boat into the, into the deep. The Bible says he looks at Christ, and now what he says, Lord, Master, Teacher, depart from me. For I'm an evil man. You have nothing to do with me. I'm so sinful. I'm even shocked that you have business with me to transact. 
the elect of God. Drawn out of the world. Think of Peter. Think of James. Think of John. Who are these people? Think of Matthew. Levi. Who was Levi? Tax collector. A robber. He was an extortionist. These people are drawn out of the world and given to the Son, that the Son may possess them. Now, it will get more interesting when you go to back to chapter number 6 of John. Still in John, now flip a few pages to chapter number 6, and you will see these people. How then the Father, out of his immense love, then gives them as a love gift for his son. It is because he loves the son so much that he gives the son a people for his treasured position. It is as it were, the father looking for a bride for his son, is the point. The bride is not perfect. The bride must be adopted with beauty before the son marries on the day when the marriage will be consummated. Look at chapter number 6. Strong words employed here. Verse 44. We'll come back to verse 37 in a short way. Verse 44. <clears throat> now, it will help read from verse 41. So, the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? He's a lunatic. That's the point. Jesus answered them, verse 43. Do not grumble among yourselves. Verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That is the solution. They are grumbling. They don't want to go to Christ. They have nothing to do with him. In fact, later on in verse number 65, in verse number 60, they're going to complain about his teachings. And in verse number 66, they're going to depart from him. They will no longer follow him. The Lord tells him, don't worry about it. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. That's a promise. These people must be drawn to the sun from the world. This is an efficacious, effectual drawing of a sinner from the world where he belongs to the sun. This sinner has no ability in and of himself to go to the sun because he doesn't even desire. Look at the context. These people are grumbling. They are not happy with the Christ. That is the sin, until the father draws. Now, it will help probably to explain what that verse means quickly before we move. No one can. Can is a word of ability and inability. Not, not one, no one may. This is no one can. No one, universal negative. Can, ability. Come to me unless, conditional. There's a condition. The father, the condition there, sent me. Who sent me? Draws him. The condition is that the father must draw him unless the father draws him. He'll remain in situ. He won't come. No one, not even the elect, is the point I'm making. Not even Adam, not even Abraham, not even Isaac, not even a single one, not even Peter, not even John in this context. This is a universal negation, negative. Because it does express and connote the idea of total inability of man. Man is not willing to go to God. Man is not willing to go to Christ. The Father must do something for them to go. He must draw. That drawing is the concept we have when you, are in a, you have a well. A well of water, maybe these children may not understand because they're in town. But back in the village, those who struggle with water, as you move away from the, from the towns, people dig wells, okay? And then there's a container that has a very long rope. You throw the container with the rope inside the water, and what do you do? You draw water with it. It's the word used here. 
There is a force that the Father exerts to draw them out of the world. The world is that water inside there. So that they brought, brought of Christ. Saving them. That's what we say. That, we say that salvation is by grace. The Father, by his word and by his spirit, must draw them efficaciously out of the world that they come to Christ. Now, look at verse 65. The Lord repeats, <laughs> so that you understand that it is impossible unless the Father does something. He repeats himself. And he said, this is why I told you, this is why I told you, it has already been said. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. I have heard people say that you choose to be saved. <laughs> we are just debunking that theory, isn't it? <laughs> There's nothing like choosing to be saved here. If you have been saved, it means the Father has drawn you to Christ. So you owe it all to grace. What, how do you say? All to him? I owe. Is the point here. The elect of God, the people for whom the Son prays, have nothing to boast about. They have nothing good intrinsically in them, inherently in them, save for the grace of God that draws them out of the world effectually that they may be saved. We need to go back to chapter 17 and see the point. Back to chapter 17. Observe what verse 2 says and verse number 3 about this drawing. Again, we can read from verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. Verse number two, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given. Now, verse three explains what that means. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. When the Father draws them from the world, he gives them to the Son. What does the Son give them? Eternal life. All of them. The Son gives them, all of them, eternal life. None of the elect will miss eternal life. We don't have hypothetical elect of God. We have two elect of God. All of them, the Father, the Son gives life. Again, back to chapter number six, so that you're in the context with me here. Back to chapter number six. We are. So, you have heard of the Armenians being like gramblers here. Those who believe that salvation is a choice. Um, <laughs> they are the ones grumbling here. <laughs> You've had Aminas grumble. Oh, I can't choose to be saved. I can't choose to be unsaved. And so, what are you saying? You know, they are grumbling here. The Aminas, the reformed people, are solid. <laughs> they are knowing that this is because of God's grace. What he, oh, God is glory. Huh? We give Him the glory. We give Him the praise. Doxology and devotion. The one who is being defended here is the reformed, not the Aminas. The Aminian is grumbling here. <laughs> Let's debunk the Aminian here in verse number uh, 6, 37. Again, all, exclusive. All that the Father gives me, what, what follows? Will come to me, not may. Will come to me. <laughs> and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will. That's the reason. Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. The son will never lose any of them. Now, what follows? But raise it up on the last day. Verse 40, 
For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Both salvation and eschatology promised the end of time. He receives both the immediate blessings of salvation and the ultimate blessings of salvation, including resurrection from the dead. Two, three Sundays ago, we looked at resurrection, isn't it? What do you say as those who will be resurrected from by Christ? They belong to, to Christ. We are just debunking Amina theology, in short. This is the point we are making. <clears throat> if you are Christ's disciple already, you believe in Christ, recognize this. That this, what the Lord is doing here, this prayer, is a demonstration of his unconditional, unmerited, and deserved love. Because you, just like the rest of mankind, were in the world and of the world. Save for the Father that Christ has, by his Father and his Spirit, they have drawn you out of the world. Now, if that sinks in your heart, I'm very sure that what will flow from your heart will be gratitude. And so, that's why those who are truly redeemed of Christ, they look at themselves and in their unworthiness, what they can only do is to fall down in deep contrition and appreciation and thankfulness. It's no wonder we saw in the morning that in heaven, whatever they can say is salvation belongs to who? Our God and the Father, and to the Lamb who sits on the throne. They are saying it does not belong to us that we are saved. This must invoke devotion in your heart to Christ. This must invoke devotion to God. This must invoke doxology, thankfulness, and glory going to the Father. It does not stop there, friends. We have to proceed to the next point. We have seen, first of all, we have seen of something of their uh, relationship to God. First of all, they belong to the Father. Then secondly, the Father has given them to the Son out of the world. And we have seen in the third place that the Son gives them eternal life. That is how they are related to God. The Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In the second place, let's observe their revelation of God. What is it that they know about God? What has been revealed to them about God? So, in eternity past, they belong to the Father. The Father, in real time, gives them to the Son. The Son saves them by giving them eternal life. How is it that they are saved? Through revelation. Let's look at verse 6 again with me. Verse 6. John 17, verse 6. How is it that they are saved? And others are not saved. The Son says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Again, does not say that I have manifested your name to everyone, okay? <laughs> you do see that. <laughs> he has manifested the name of the Father to the people whom the Father gave him out of the world. In other words, the, the Son is saying that he reveals the Father and his, his truth to these people. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. You as they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now, look at verse 7. Now, at this particular moment, they know, underline the word know, now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. This is a people to whom revelation is channeled by the Son. The Son reveals of the name of the Father. In other words, what it means by the name is the nature of the Father, the character of the Father. We are going to look at that shortly, what that means in its essence, and why John recall, recalls that Christ is the Word of God in this context. Now, Christ manifests the name of the Father to these people, these specific people. 
And in verse number seven, these people come to know that everything that the father has given to the son is from the father. They have knowledge and understanding. They understand these things. A short while, Deacon Amos was helping us to see the parables. And the disciples were concerned why Christ would speak in parables. And the people would not understand. The parables were not meant for people to understand. And the disciples asked the Lord, Master, you are speaking in parables. Of what purpose? It tells them that you should count yourself privileged because to, this, to you belongs this truth. I'm revealing them to you. They've been revealed to you. But for them, it has been hidden from them. He manifests the name of the Father, specifically the people that the Father gave. There begins the salvation. Where does salvation begin? Revelation. Did you see that when the Conboni was helping us to see Abraham, isn't it? Where did it begin in Genesis 12? Revelation. God reveals himself to Abraham. That's where it begins. Now, what do they know? Verse number seven. That they, they know that everything that you have given me is from you. Now, go back to verse number three. These people, Christ has manifested the Father's name to them. In verse number three, the Bible says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, that Father, okay? The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It begins with a revelation of God the Father. They understand of the character of God the Father. They understand of the nature of that God the Father, that this God the Father is so loving that even the, the fact that he brings the Son to the world to take our natures and assume our duties is a demonstration of love. They begin to understand that, wow, what a loving Father we are. That this Father sends his Son. He doesn't send an angel. You see, it begins to make sense. Then they begin to think, so, okay, we have a Father in heaven, okay. This father does not send another human being to save us. He doesn't send an angel to save us. He sends his own very son. Isn't that love? And so John writes in 3.16 that for God so loved the world. They begin to see of the love of God. The father is so loving that he sends the son. But the son is so loving because when the father gives, him, gives these people to him, he receives them and he saves them. He even prays for them. And so they understand that the Trinity, in the Trinity, dwells love. We look at love later on in this chapter as we went through. Friends, we must go to chapter, back to chapter 1 to understand a few things before we come back about this revelation. Back to chapter 1. I'm sorry, I've not been reading John, so we have to refer to a few passages. Otherwise... If you had them in our minds, I'll just mention them in passing. In John chapter number one, the very context of John, so that you appreciate what, I'm, what we are saying. Look at how Christ is described in the beginning, in the prologue, verse one. In the beginning was the word. And repetition, the word was with God and the word was God, the word. Why, among the many titles that Christ would assume, does Christ assume the title of the word? Verse 18. Verse 18. Explains. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Who reveals the Father? Christ Jesus. That's why he's the word. Is the revelation is the point. See the connection between verse 1 and verse 18. He is the ultimate revelation of God the Father. So when it comes, when we come to chapter, chapter 14 and verse number 6, and you know, uh, Philip is asking, show us the Father. What does he tell him? You have seen me, you have seen the Father. I am the word, the revelation of the Father. The Father is revealed in the Son, is the point I'm making. 
And so, in Hebrews, in chapter number 1, verse number 3, the Bible says, He is the effulgence, the radiance of the glory of God. The exact imprint of His nature. The reveal of the Father, the Son. And so, in Colossians 1, 15, what did you see? He is the image of the invisible God. His revelation. He manifests the Father. So he came to manifest the Father. And John says, this is eternal life. That's how it begins. That these people may know you, the only true God, and the Son whom you have sent. The people who understand, and they know and appreciate, they have eternal life. I want to, to give you another passage. Let's go quickly to chapter 5. Let me add another one as we proceed quickly. In chapter 5 and verse 24. I said, I'm sorry, we have not read this book, so we'll keep referring to a few passages here and there. In verse number 24 of chapter 5. Now, Christ is the amen of God. So he always begins with truly, truly. Means amen, amen. Assuredly. assuredly. Verse 24, chapter 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. The one who believes the Father. Revelation that brings salvation begins with the revelation of God the Father. And God the Son, who then reveals that God the Father. You begin to see. That's why our gospel is a Trinitarian gospel. We preach God the Father, we preach God the Son, we preach God the Holy Spirit. Because all of them are involved in a salvation. The Father authors salvation, the Son accomplishes salvation, the Spirit applies that salvation. Necessarily, we must be Trinitarian. Salvation comes when there's the revelation of God. Who truly God is? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit of God. Now, you want to appreciate that the, the Son must do this. Again, I'll move away from uh, John a bit show you, to show you something in Matthew quickly before we wind up. Something in Matthew 11 and 27. Again, something that Christ said. The first synoptic gospel is Matthew. If you're there in chapter 11, you'll see something that the, father say, the son says about the father. How this is mutual in terms of revelation and how this is serious when it comes to salvation and how this is annoying to the Armenians. <laughs> now, in Matthew 11, 27, let's speak from 25. In context. At this time, Jesus declared, again, he will always refer to God as Father. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your own gracious will. It was the Father's will that these things be revealed to some people, okay? <laughs> it's not our will. Verse 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. And to anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Who chooses to reveal? The Son. I don't know what an Armenian says about that. <laughs> this is exclusively the work of God is the point of making. It is meant that they, once this should be done, when this type of preaching is over, the elect should go to their feet and cry. Isn't that what's happening in heaven? They're falling down prostrate. Wow, salvation belongs to God. They can't be standing. They can't be upstanding. This invokes worship in their hearts. This invokes reverence and fear. Although they're rejoicing, they're rejoicing with the trembling. Because they're unworthy and deserving. 
Let's close in the third place by looking at their response to God. How they respond. So that we can know that they, they, they elect. We are sure. Can you be sure that these are the people that they elect? Now, what we have been looking at is the behind the curtains. Now let's come to the stage and see how these people can be known that they are truly the elect of God from our side, from the human point of view. We have seen from the sovereign point of view, they have a, a relationship with God. God is revealed to them. What about from the human point of view? What I'm saying is this. There is an intricate balance between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Yes, the father chooses the people to be saved. The son prays for them and dies for them and saves them. The spirit applies that work of the son. But the question is, what does the elect do when they receive the revelation? And what do they do when they understand of their relationship with God? How do they respond in real time? In other words, when that revelation comes, what happens to that revelation? How do they respond? Again, observe in verse number six in the first place, what happens? Yes, the son has manifested the father's name to the people whom the father gave him. And he says, you as they were, and you gave them to me. Now look at how they respond. You as they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Is that in your Bible? They have kept your word. In other words, they have obeyed your word. How do the elect of God respond to God's word? They obey. They keep it. That's how to know that you're an elect. <laughs> we can't know. I don't know who is elect. It's not written on your head, forehead. From the human point, I don't know. Unless I see you believe, you keep the word. So when I preach to you like this and you keep the word, you are the elect of God. When a son, a daughter, when a child in this hall, when an adult, when a woman and a man, when you receive that word of God and you keep it, you are the elect. Because the elect must keep the word. That's what makes them the elect of God from this side of things, from the human side of things. Look at verse number eight. It is, this is sustained. Verse number eight. Two things are mentioned in verse number eight. Now, beginning verse number seven, now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. So they understand things. Verse number eight, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them. What do they do with it? The word. <laughs> they receive the word revelation. They don't reject the revelation of God. That's the point. Some people reject. Remember chapter number six? When people are grumbling, they were rejecting the word of God. And so Christ tells the disciples, what about you? Don't you want to go also? And, and Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We are not going. Here is where we belong. They receive the word. As difficult as it can be, as incomprehensible as those truths can be, sometimes we even battle our hearts and our minds. How is it that God, who predestines people for salvation, again expects them to believe? How is it that God chooses some people and not some for salvation? We can understand that, but what we do, do is we receive whatever has been revealed to us. If we understand everything, then we are God. So we cannot understand everything. It doesn't stop there. They receive. They don't reject. For I have given them, verse number 8, the words that you gave me, and they have received, in past tense, they have received them. And what follows? And have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you said. Look at the response. They obey, or they keep, they receive, they believe the truth. How would you know an individual who is an elect? They obey the word, okay? They receive the revelation of God. 
they believe the revelation of God. It's that simple. So if you're here in this hall, you hear the truth of Christ preached and you obey the command to believe in Christ, the command to uh, repent of their sins. You receive that truth without grumbling in your heart, even if you don't understand. And you believe that whatever comes from Father and through the Son mediation is that which God speaks and that is a promise that will come to pass. We are saved. That is the elect of God. This is not some generic group of people, some hypothetical group of people. They must respond to God's word. And they must obey, receive, believe. The question we must ask immediately, therefore, is this. Does this describe you in this hall? Are you a person who has received the revelation of God? Are you a person who has obeyed the truth, obedience, and have you believed what has been revealed? about Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit. And especially, have you believed that it is God the Son, in this context, who God the Father sent as our Savior? Do you believe that Christ is the one who was sent to save us? And that you believe that when he died on the cross, he died for you? That he did not have to die, but out of love he dies. And that death, he dies not his death, but his death for the case, in the case of the sin. In other words, you must believe that you are righteous, you are wretched, and Christ is righteous, that you receive his merits. Do you believe in Christ? And do you believe in his promises? Do you believe in his death? Do you believe in his resurrection? Do you believe the truth of Christ Jesus in this all today? You are the elect, is the point. It is an urgent call to anyone who has not received these truths in their hearts and has not obeyed them and has not believed them. Please. Make haste. Don't question, don't ask questions. Oh, what about the people in India? The question, you're asking the wrong question. Ask the question, Am I, have I obeyed the truth? Have I received the truth? Have I believed the truth? Leave the rest unto God. He'll sort it out. You ask us to receive, believe, and obey. There's no other way, isn't it? <laughs> to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. That is the elect of God. One who has a very special relationship to God, one who has the revelation of God that is special, and one who responds to God ultimately unto salvation, savingly. If you're not an elect in this place, respond. Respond, obey, believe, receive. If you're the letter of God have said, this is a call for devotion and doxology, praise and thankfulness, worship. We can't pay for this great gift of eternal life. We can only be thankful for it. Always be thankful, even as you serve the Lord. And the Lord bless you. Amen.